this discussion is by two leaders in the insurance and finance sector. Uh, Jay Bruns is our host, and Jay was the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Hartford. He was there for 12 years, has deep experience in insurance and finance, and he's now the Climate Change Advisor to the Washington State Insurance Commissioner. So advising the Insurance Commissioner on all things climate, and he has been, Mike Kreidler has been a real leader as an Insurance Commissioner in Washington, uh, requiring the insurance industry to get ahead of climate risks. Um, and he'll have Chris Bell, who's now Guardian Life, long finance experience as well. So I'm really looking forward to having them. Uh, please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're very excited to be here, and I hope that uh, for in the next half hour that Chris and I uh, will be able to leave you with some, a better understanding about how um, the insurance industry is working and maybe not working on, on climate change and, uh, and also the role that insurance regulators play. I want to also uh, very much uh, thank our, uh, the Sun Valley Forum and our host uh, Amy for, uh, for welcoming us back again this year. My, uh, my boss, Mike Kreidler, uh, sends his greetings. Uh, we have uh, a great and collaborative relationship with, with Amy that we're just delighted to continue with. And uh, I was thinking about her this morning when uh, at, at breakfast I heard the ubiquitous question at this forum, and that is, well, how did you get to know Amy? <laughs> and I'm thinking that that, that question has probably been asked uh, by at least a thousand different people. I mean, as you all know, she's quite a, a connector, and uh, I think we all benefit from that. Um, well, um, I, I want to pivot. This morning we heard from, I think, eight different companies, and almost all eight of them have been created, founded in the last decade uh, or, or, or more recently. We're going to now talk about an industry that started <clears throat> almost 500 years ago, the insurance industry. It started uh, with Lloyds of London. Uh, these were ship owners in, in, the, in London who, um, uh, back then, it was pretty dangerous to send a ship to the New World and back, and these ships um, went down regularly. And um, the a number of ship owners got together around the table and decided, well, in order for us to mitigate our risk, to manage our risk, Maybe it's best that we all pool the risk. And so if a ship goes down, not just that ship owner, but everybody pays a portion of that. And that's the, the basis for modern insurance. Before we get into um, insurance and climate change, and before I turn the mic over to Chris, I wanted to give a little bit of a level set about insurance. Um, it's a risk transfer mechanism. You all know if you have insurance, I think everybody in the room will, um, that you write a contract with your insurance company, and that's, that spells out how, what the insurance company is going to cover and what it's not going to cover. Um, insurers have, for these past almost 500 years, been, I would argue, pretty good managers of risk. They know how, how much risk that they are taking on generally. Uh, they know how to price for that risk. It's a private sector effort, and, um, and so, um, and they are uh, pretty, I would say, well regulated by the state-based insurance uh, regulators across this country. When you look about uh, at the, the size of the insurance market, um, the U.S. insurance activity comprises about 3% of our uh, uh, GDP in the United States. And if you think uh, that, I think last year, our total GDP in the U.S. was 21 trillion, so it's a very large a large industry. That industry is spread across 6,000 different companies that operate in the, in the United States. So it's a very diffuse uh, uh, industry as well. And um, th those 6,000 companies, if you add up all of the investments that they have, uh, it's $9 trillion. Now we're gonna talk about insurance investments uh, a little later, so I thought I would, I wanted to make the point about how insurance investments are different. Um, we heard uh, from the banking industry yesterday and how, how um, banks make decisions on investments. 
insurance companies, what they're doing is they're collecting premium that you and I send to them every month, um, and they know some of us are gonna have an accident or need a payout. Um, but in the meantime, they wanna um, make some money on that, on the, those investments, so they take the money in and, almost, and invest it generally in fixed income investments. Um, if you, uh, I think I'm right when I say that if you look at the total $9 trillion worth of investments across the country, um, uh, the largest single, sh single share is in U.S. Treasuries uh, because it's a safe investment. They invest in all, all sorts of other uh, uh, government bonds as well as corporate bonds and uh, other, uh, um, lots of other um, instruments that give them a fixed return, but they really don't invest very much in the stock market, say. So uh, they're different from, from banks and private equity firms and others, uh, foundations and others who invest their money. Not much goes into the stock market. Um, and um, with regard to what an insurance uh, uh, commissioner does, I, each of the 50 plus insurance commissioners across the country, we really have um, 50 states, plus there's a commissioner from the District of Columbia, and then there are uh, commissioners from the, the U.S. territories as well, so, and Puerto Rico. So if you add it all up, I think there are 57 different insurance commissioners across the country. Their job is to protect the citizens of their state or territory um, and to ensure that insurance companies are following the laws and uh, encouraging them to do, uh, to make sure that they are uh, treating their, their customers fairly. Um, the other big thing that insurance regulators think about a lot is to ensure that the companies remain solvent, uh, that they are prudent in their investments and their underwriting because um, if those insurance companies go under, then um, the, the, the citizens of the state are, are not well protected, obviously. Uh, but so uh, they, they care a lot about solvency as well. On climate, um, insurers, in, especially at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, this is this group Nash in the US nationally, uh, have really made some big steps on um, uh, asking, uh, requiring companies to be uh, good with, their, um, with transparency and encouraging them to do what they can to help us all get to net zero. Uh, I'm gonna stop there and uh, turn it over to uh, Chris Fowle, who, uh, as you know, is head of uh, ESG integration for investments at Guardian Life. But importantly for me, he just comes from, re very recently from uh, the Principles for Responsible Investment, and before then he was at CDP. So he, I know he's gonna be speaking personally, uh, not for Guardian Life, but he brings a lot of uh, background to this that I think will help us with this discussion. Thank you, Jay. And it, it's fa fantastic to be here my first time in, in Sun Valley, and I've really enjoyed meeting many of you uh, and engaging in fantastic conversations and, and learning a lot in the process. And, and it's true uh, what Jay says in terms of uh, where I'm coming from. First of all, I work at Guardian Life, but it's a very new role for me. I've been, I've been there for less than two months. And so, in fact, uh, my comments today are my own personal comments and not related to uh, Guardian Life's strategy with regard to ESG, although you know, part, my, new, my new role is to help think about ESG strategy for investments specifically at Guardian Life going forward. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about my prior role. I was with an organization called the Principles for Responsible Investment for more than five years as the director for the Americas helping manage signatory relationships across North and South America. And this organization has helped many types of investors, including insurance companies, uh, think about how to integrate ESG into their investment processes. And in fact, there are more than almost are now 5,000 members of the PRI around the world. Uh, the, the, the signatory members of the PRI make a commitment to a set of six principles, which in total allow them to uh, at a high level, understand, benchmark their current process against a uh, well-regarded, road-tested set of um, uh, principles, ideas, uh, processes that they can use to start thinking about responsible investment and how it applies to their context, 
to their organization, how they invest, meaning if they're di directly investing in the markets, buying the stocks or bonds or other types of financial assets themselves directly, or doing it through third-party managers that they might hire to do it on their behalf. The organization, PRI, was actually founded by the United Nations more than 15 years ago. It's now a standalone independent nonprofit headquartered in London, but retains the two affiliations with the UN, both with UNFFI, the United Nations Environmental Program for Financial Institutions, as well as the UN Global Compact. And uh, the total assets under management are more than $121 trillion at this point. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean by responsible in, in investment. And, and here I'm showing you a definition that the PRI presents as uh, what it means. Uh, and essentially, it's, you can boil it down to thinking about a strategy and a process for incorporating ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues, into an investment process uh, and thinking about active ownership. And so that's a pretty general definition you know, that's relatively high level. And there's a reason for that. It's that there are, as I'd said earlier, many different types of investors that are part of the PRI and that look to the PRI for guidance even if they're not signatory members. So, ESG integration is a relatively broad uh, uh, set of practices that investors can pick and choose from to fit their organizational context, the resources they have, and as I said earlier, how they invest, whether it's directly or indirectly. And what are some of the factors or ESG issues that one might consider uh, should be incorporated into an investment process. Many investors will tell you that, uh, for example, if they're a fixed income focused investor, uh, they're, they're, they're looking at the credit quality of an, uh, of an issuer, uh, a company that's issuing a bond, for example, and that they're already taking into account the most material financial risks that could affect the ability of that issuer to repay their obligations, their bonds, uh, at maturity. What I, what I have on the slide here uh, is an example of some of the uh, risks identified by participants in a World Economic Forum annual survey. This one is uh, a little dated. It's from 2019, so pre-pandemic. Certainly, uh, um, uh, pandemics would be at the top of the list if this had been done in 2020 um, and on. But I think the, the example still very much holds in that Many of the top risks seen by the survey participants here can be related to ESG issues. Uh, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that you know, many of those issues are perhaps uh, newer in the investment context, and there isn't as much context, information, data, um, examples to learn from. And so it's challenging for investors, even if they're very good credit investors, um, and understanding the ability of an, a company to repay debt, um, still very challenging. And so that's why organizations like the one that I'm working with now um, are looking to bring in external knowledge and resources to help them um, understand these issues uh, and comply now with certain uh, responsibilities they have. Uh, they're, they're feeling the sort of the, the, the pressure, if you will, from many different perspectives. There's that, the data, the, the factors, the materiality, we call it, of the risk factors that they're thinking about. There's the market demand coming from their clients. Um, so in the, in, the, in the case of an insurance company, it could be policyholders. Um, uh, if you're a pension, it could be the beneficiaries of a pension, et cetera. And they're thinking about regulation, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, and all of this is underlain, as, I, as you can see on the slide, uh, by better and better uh, analysis, information from academics, also from the so-called sell side of Wall Street, those analysts and researchers that are creating um, tradable ideas for the buy side, the folks uh, like an insurance company that are buying the assets that the banks and other sell side uh, folks are, are selling. There's a lot more information and analysis sort of proving the case that ESG does make a difference um, when you're thinking about 
uh, about this work. And so um, I want to um, stop and, and, and maybe, um, you know, with Jay, talk a little bit about the regulatory uh, tailwinds that we're seeing, whether it's from the New York State Department of Financial Services, which is our primary regulator. We're regulated at the state level, as Jay had mentioned, the NEIC um, that Jay mentioned, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which has been mentioned a few times today, and then uh, a robust set of what I characterize here as international norms. And there's a bit of an alphabet soup there at the bottom. Some of them you might have heard of, the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Uh, CDP, where I used to work, the former Car Carbon Disclosure Project, a global organization working on environmental disclosure um, and collecting that on behalf of investors and feeding it back to investors as inputs into their investment processes. The PRI, where I also worked um, and I described already, uh, and then the PSI, which is actually relevant to the other side of the balance sheet of an insurance company, the so-called um, underwriting side, is the principles of sustainable insurance, which is working much like PRI is on the investment side of the equation. Um, so Jay, did we want to talk a little bit more about the, the regulatory aspects then? Mm -hmm. Yes, especially from uh, now uh, uh, sitting in my role as a, a regulator, I wanted to focus a little bit on the NEIC as well as talk about the SEC effort. Uh, we've heard about the SEC effort a little bit. Securities and Exchange Commission is uh, working to uh, require all publicly traded companies in the United States to uh, take the data that they have on climate change and put it in their financial information using the, the, the template set out by this TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. And if they are on, successful with the timeline that they're on no, that, now, that won't be a requirement probably in two years or so. Um, separately, um, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, under my, my uh, 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 boss, Mike Kreidler, in 2009 began to require all large insurers in the United States to report annually on how, their, uh, how climate change affects their business. Basically, it was an eight-page, eight-question survey. The questions came right out of CDP. Um, the answers are public. Uh, they are on the. Uh, they are required annually. They go on the California website uh, in, of the Department of Insurance. You can look there and see how your insurer answered that quest questionnaire in 2009, 2015, last year. The NEIC at a meeting that I attended um, just last month uh, in Kansas City decided that uh, after we've been working on this for two years, but as of the end of this year, all of those companies that re that report. Um, that, that are required to report will be reporting under the TCFD guidelines. So that means really the SEC effort is important for the, uh, the rest of the economy and, and all that, but we've actually preempted in a way, uh, the state regulators have preempted on, in the insurance industry, they are already by this end of this year being gonna be required to report. And we capture uh, through this uh, about 80% of the written premium in the United States. Uh, that's because we capture the very largest companies. We don't require smaller insurance companies to do it. The SEC rules, when they come into effect, they only capture publicly traded insurance companies, not insurance companies by size. So they would, when they do bring in their rules, um, they, that would only capture only about 35% of the uh, of um, the uh, uh, of net uh, of written premium in the United States. So well, I I just wanted to point out that uh, in the insurance industry, I think our regulators have moved more quickly. And uh, I, as far as I know, there is no other industry worldwide that uh, where their regulator has been requiring them to report solely on climate change and its effect on their business outside of the U.S. insurance industry. So. No, it, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it is a very big development for the you know, United States regulators and, and at the state level in particular. New York has been at the forefront, I would say, yes. in terms of defining some of the requirements and what they're really looking for their insurers to report back to them on. Uh, and the New York State Department of Financial Services will actually be using the NAIC's climate survey mechanism uh, to ascertain exactly where the insurers doing business in New York are. So all of these efforts are, are connected. And to 
um, a certain degree, I would say, informed by what's been happening globally in the insurance sector. Would you say that's fair? Yes, I think that is fair. I will say, uh, and um, I'm, we're very involved with what's with what's happening globally. My boss was also a founder of something called the Sustainable Insurance Forum, which is insurance regulators around the world who are, care about climate change. And uh, now the Depart US Department of Treasury, NEIC, and uh, many other countries have, have joined it. It went from, I think, eight when he was there to uh, when he started it to uh, help start it with the California Insurance Commissioner to 35 members uh, today. Um, but so that's the, the transparency and, and uh, uh, disclosure is very important. But I think we should talk a little bit more about what else uh, insurance companies can do. I was just asked about, well, why don't insurers do more on mitigation? And let's look at the, uh, the risks that they face. Uh, um, you know, they, uh, they, they have to manage all kinds of risks. The risk of uh, you all having a, uh, a, an auto accident, uh, pandemics, cybersecurity. They're looking, uh, insurance is a big data industry. They collect massive amounts of data in order to price their products and in order for the insurance company to decide whether they want to be in that market. Um, the, so one question is, what, what, why aren't insurers more involved in, in paying for the mitigation of risks? And that's a very good question. And it is a private sector industry and so uh, that is regulated. So you know, I, uh, one, cent, one question is, I, I, I see some level of, of mitigation. For example, uh, in some markets, insurers uh, will give uh, discounts to, to people, just like a good driving discount. Uh, they'll give a, a discount if you uh, take um, uh, precautions in your house to, to do, use tie downs where there's wind so that the likelihood of your roof blowing off in the next big windstorm or hurricane is lower. Um, fi uh, for communities that use firewise principles, which means you, know, uh, you don't put your firewood uh, next to your house and you make sure you clean out your gutters uh, from pine needles and things like that, uh, in s some insurers have decided that if the, uh, the insured uses firewise principles, they may give them a break on that. So there are, at the margins, I would say, insurance companies do care about uh, mitigation. But insurers, you know, the other thing about insurers is they, um, I, as I said, I think they manage their risk very well. Sometimes the way insurance companies manage risk is not necessarily in the best public interest. And uh, my boss is very keen to make sure that these markets work well because uh, in some places, uh, 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 right now California, uh, a lot of insurers have decided that the fire risk in, in many locations is too high. And so they're pulling back from the market. Uh, or they are uh, raising the prices of insurance just so quickly because they see all of a sudden the, to cover the risk that they now feel that they face, they, they need to charge more. Uh, m in most places, the, the, um, those rates that they are charging have to be approved by the insurance department. Um, but you can, you can quickly get out of balance if, um, if, if the, the insurers aren't managing, uh, collect, collectively aren't managing the risks that they face in a cer certain market. And, it, and regulators are very tough on making sure that uh, insurers, they can't, they, they, they're allowed to leave uh, the market, but they have to do so under certain circumstances that, uh, to prove that they have to do it, so. Mm -hmm. Now that's really interesting, and those were great examples on, on sort of the physical risk, the, you know, the mitigation um, side of, say, for a property and casualty uh, insurance company. And on the life side, I'm on a, I'm on a life insurance company. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest at Guardian specifically, but more broadly within the, the life in, uh, industry to, to look at well-being um, broadly in terms of um, uh, you know, how the, what, what are the health implications of the insured and how that can uh, be improved through some of the um, um, you know, related uh, incentives that the, that the insurer might, might provide. And, and I think that does extend actually uh, to the investment side of, of the balance sheet as well in that, and we've heard a lot about the SDGs, the Sustainable De Development Goals, we've heard about impact investing, et cetera. Uh, but I think even in, call it the more mainstream and, and, and I'll dare, dare to say more conservative investment space, and insurers are fair, fair to say more conservative investors, there's more of an of a interest um, and an impetus to, to explore the outcomes of, the, of their investments, not just in an impact portfolio, which might be created specifically for um, specific impact goals, but more broadly, um, 
in the portfolio. And, and I think that that trend will, will continue as the data continues to improve and we're able to actually measure, communicate, be more transparent uh, about um, the intentionality behind some of the in investments and the um, outcomes or impacts associated um, you know, as, as relates to the environment and society. Well, we have about 30 seconds. I, wanted, I had one other point that Chris and I have talked with uh, uh, beginning our dialogue a couple of months ago. And that is, we talked about how, how can insurers use these investments that they make. Insurers uh, buy a ton of utility bonds. Mm. Uh, some, mostly 5% of their, of their overall is uh, overall investments or utilities. Doesn't sound very, like very much, but I talked to one insurer once who they did an analysis of their, uh, of their investments and they thought that that represented about 65% of their greenhouse gas emissions holding in their, in their investments. So we're thinking about why don't, we, why don't insurers have a dialogue with the utility industry to say, look, we buy a lot of your bonds, that's fine, but we want you to move more quickly to, uh, to, not, uh, to renewable. Uh, and as it turns out, Chris has uncovered that uh, that happens already in Asia, so we want to bring it to the United States. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to us. Chris, any last word? No, I, I think this is fantastic. Uh, really happy to share some of the learnings that I've made over the last um, eight plus years on, on my journey and, and uh, look forward to communicating with you in future about the, uh, the um, uh, actual practical work I'll be doing with Guardian going forward. Thank you very much. Okay.